Welcome to your NCFE Level 2, Certificate in Principles of Business Administration, Session 4 of 4. In this session, we will look at understand how to store, retrieve and archive information and principles of customer service. My name is Phil Church and I shall be your narrator and guide for this session. This NCFE Level 2 Online Certificate in Principles of Business Administration is brought to you by Poplar Harker and Solutions Equinox Training Solutions for Online Learning. The units being covered are Understand how to store, retrieve and archive information and Understand customer service. So what does your learning journey look like? Well, we completed principles of providing administrative services for session one. And then session two was principles of business document production and information management and understanding communication in the business environment. And then session three of four was understand employer organizations understand how to develop working relationships with colleagues. And then from then on, you would have gone on to have completed your assessment one. And following this session, understand how to store, retrieve and archive information and principles of custom service. And following this session is the online teaching, teaching support. You should be able to go on to complete your online assessment two. And there is full tutor support throughout the whole program. Following this session and the completion of the assignment and the previous assignment, you should hopefully go on to complete your qualification. So completing your assignments. It is important to understand the action verbs in the assignment questions. And the action verbs are defined. Your answer must give the precise meaning of a word. Describe. In order to describe something, you must give a detailed account of it. Explain. You need to ensure that your answer is clear, revealing relevant facts. And identify. Point out and explain. Your answer should establish who or what something is, rather than just a list. We will tutor you throughout the program and help you completing the two assignments. And once you submit these assignments online, they will be assessed. All of your completed assignments will then be submitted for internal and external quality assurance. Once this process is complete, you'll be awarded your qualification. Should you require any assistance, our remote assistance service, we can be contacted at learners at solutionsequinox.com and your emails must be marked NCFE Business Admin in the subject heading. And our two telephone numbers are there for your benefit. In this section, we will look at understand information storage and retrieval. And to do that, we will describe systems and procedures for storing and retrieving information. Outline legal and organisational requirements for information retrieval. Explain how to create filing systems to facilitate information identification and retrieval. Explain how to use different search techniques to locate and retrieve information. And describe what to do when problems arise when storing or retrieving information. Information can be stored and retrieved using different systems and procedures. There are physical. And there are pros and cons to using physical systems that store and enable information to be retrieved. And let's have a look at some of those. Physical information, such as reports, presentations, memos, letters, financial and handbooks, 
stored using filing in lay with labels and folder tabs and they're easy to access you can walk over to the filing cabinet open the drawer flick through the storage method used and take your file out so they're easy to alter and remove documents sometimes you can just strike through a piece of paper or a word or remove an entire piece of paper completely but they can be destroyed by fire or rain and if you have a fire the sprinkler systems could also cause uh, damage so unless you have a filing cabinet system that's fire or weatherproof this might be a cause of loss and they can be lost inadvertently they could be put down collected up with waste and thrown away or in some cases files have even been left on trains can be time consuming looking for the particular documents that you're after they cannot be changed or edited directly you may have to open up and change an entire word document or retype an entire document and documents can be misplaced and filing systems do take up a lot of space when I used to be a junior clerk served for process uh, process server for solicitors um, half a floor was taken up by the filing cabinets they are indexed using indexing guides or cross indexing they can be stored in chronological numerical or alphabetical order or even geographical order for electronic systems such as emails files documents reports and data using applications such as Outlook Gmail Hotmail USB external drive and hard drives with a title subject category reference number date author storage and end date these can all be found within the file info system. You can share these using systems such as Dropbox or iCloud or any other cloud based system. But think about the pros and cons of electronic or file sharing systems for your assignment. Have a think about the problems that you may have faced when using these systems assignment question is asking you to describe systems and procedures for storing and retrieving information so some of your pros and cons should be included in this answer so for physical look at the reports presentations easy to access they can be lost time consuming and take up a lot of space just to name but a few for electronic you're looking at email files documents applications such as Outlook, Gmail and so forth, sharing systems such as Dropbox or any other cloud-based system that you may use, or think of any other ways that you might share a file that's electronic. Further reading can be found on pages 4 to 10 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. The six GDPR principles for retaining and storing information. Number one, retaining and storing information must be lawful, fair and transparent. There has to be legitimate grounds for collecting the data and it must not have a negative effect on the person or be used in a way they wouldn't expect. Number two, it must be limited for its purpose. Data should be collected for specified and explicit purposes and not used in a way someone wouldn't expect. Number three, adequate and necessary. It must be clear why the data is being collected and what will be done with it. Unnecessary data or information without any purpose should not be collected. Number four, accurate. Reasonable steps must be taken to keep the information up to date and change if it is inaccurate. Number five, not kept longer than needed. Data should not be kept for longer than is needed and it must be properly destroyed or deleted when it is no longer used or goes out of date. 
Number six, integrity and confidentiality. Data should be processed in a way that ensures appropriate security, including protection against unauthorised or unlawful processing, loss, damage or destruction, and kept safe and secure. Compliance. Organisations who fail to comply with GDPR could be liable for a fine up to €20 million, Euros, or up to 4% of their worldwide turnover of the preceding year of trading. Whereas there is a right for individuals to be forgotten under GDPR, there is also a lawful requirement for organisations to retain certain information concerning tax laws. Information should only be kept as required for business purposes. And simply gathering and retaining information is no longer lawful. Your assignment question is asking you for question two to outline legal and organisational requirements for information security and retention. So think back to the GDPR and its six main principles which govern how personal data should be used. What are they? Because those data can only be used for those six specific reasons. Have a think back to what we just discussed. And further reading can be found on pages four to ten of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. So, for vertical file systems, their features. They are the most common and traditional means of filing information. It is in a vertical filing system. These systems are typically utilised in offices and you usually find these in the filing cabinets you'll see in most locations. And the method of filing saves space and overcomes some of the challenges associated with with lateral filing systems. Filing cabinets are a good way of filing information vertically. Drawers tend to be subdivided using dividers and individual folders. But like everything, they have their pros and cons. The files are easy to locate and the system doesn't desert, disturb other folders. It's a good use of space. It is a cheap system and can be expanded. You can buy more filing cabinets and add to them. The system, if you buy an expensive filing cabinet that's weather and fire resistant, can be fireproof. And the folders can be arranged using any system. But locating files requires more time. The more cabinets you have, the more time it takes. And wear and tear, files can through, fall through the runners and drawers can become wedged. Lateral filing systems. They can be used in specific filing cabinet system or on shelving units. These systems are typically utilised in file storage facilities. They're easily accessible and visible, but again, they have their pros and cons. The files are easy to locate and see. And the system doesn't disturb other folders. They're good for larger documents such as plans. It's a cheap system to use and folders can be arranged using any system. But with lateral systems, more space is required and there is a limited option to expand the system due to space. Creating a filing system in vertical or lateral filing systems. Number one, the cabinet should be placed in the direction the files are to face. In lateral systems, there is a choice in files facing left, right or forward. You insert the file rails if files are to face forward. The, file, the rails to divide the width of each file drawer into sections and are sized to accommodate the width of the expandable hanging files. 
Insert expendable hanging files into the lateral file cabinet facing in the direction required. And file labels should be used listing one category title on each. File labels should be in an alphabetical order or in some order that makes the most sense for what is required. Affix the file labels to the expandable hanging folders, placing the first label on the far left of the first expandable hanging file. Place the label on the next hanging file though, so that it sits to the right of the first label. Continue until all your files are labelled. When you get to the far right of a hanging file, if you have more categories left, start back at the far left again. Label expandable file folders for subcategories by writing a subcategory title on the tape at the top of each folder. Place the file folders in the hanging file labelled with the appropriate category. And sort your documents and file them in the respective category and subcategory files. Can you think of other filing methods to facilitate information identification and retrieval? Try researching some other systems. Question 3 is asking you to explain how to create filing systems to facilitate information identification and retrieval. So I've given you two, the vertical and lateral systems. Can you think of any others that you can think of that would explain how to create filing systems to facilitate information identification and retrieval? And further reading can be found on pages 4 to 10 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. There are different search techniques that will help you to locate and retrieve information and these include with paper-based systems searching by number, by letter alphabetically, by date or location, referencing an index guide and for electronic systems the use of cloud or email database and specific information, a keyword, name, date or subject or phrase or boolean search which includes the words of and, or or not. Question 4, your assignment question is asking you to explain how to use different search techniques to locate and retrieve information. So think back to what we've just described, the paper-based and electronic systems and the different use of search techniques. Can you think of any more that you can add to this list? And further reading can be found on pages four to 10 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. What to do when problems arise when storing or retrieving information? Number one, in the event that a document cannot be located, it may be that it has been filed incorrectly. Number two, a process of elimination may enable you to find the missing information. Number three, checking files with similar names as it may have been placed there. Number four, some folders may not be accessible to you as they have restrictions placed on their access. Number five, where folders are full, new ones may be needed to be created. Follow the organisational guidelines to ensure that you are compliant to reduce the risk of information being misfiled in future. Organisations could do the following to negate problems with storing and filing information. By conducting weekly checks of folders to locate misplaced information. Conduct regular reading of information. Conducting GDPR compliance checks on a regular basis. Ensuring that software is kept up to date and is functioning correctly. And any hardware is checked and ensured that it is working correctly. Question five is asking you to describe what to do when problems arise when storing or retrieving information. 
So think back to some of the areas that we've just covered, such as misfiling, not keeping the filing up to date, and for hardware and software, and so many others that you can think of that you may have experienced in your work location. Further reading can be found on pages 4 to 10 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. In this section, we will look at understand archiving requirements. And to do that, we will describe different ways of archiving information. Describe how to retrieve archived information. And describe organizational procedures for archiving, retrieving and deleting information. Explain the importance of document retention policies to organizations and describe the security and access requirements of off-site archives. The different ways of archiving information. With manual, paper-based systems, they're given a unique number, and a list of contents with an archive date and how long that data is going to be held for, so a retention period, and a date that it will be destroyed. You must think of the GDPR and have an archive list. For electronic-based systems, which are faster, they're easier to use than manual, and the files can be moved, searched and retrieved with keystrokes and general searching. And there's an automatic alert to notify of deletion dates. Question six is asking you to describe different ways of archiving information. So think back to do with the manual, paper-based systems, and the electronic-based systems. What are the different ways that both those systems use to archive information? And can you think of any others that you could add to that list? Further reading can be found on pages 11 to 14 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. Retrieving archived information. Information can be stored and retrieved in a number of formats and these may include physical, such as a letter or fax, visual, for example, a photograph. Audio, maybe a tape recording. Digital, for example, an email. And looking up the file in the archive database. Contacting the person in charge of the archive. Giving that person the relevant information, for example, the department name, an archive box number, an archive date, and the contents that you need from the archive to be retrieved, and your reason for requesting access, and how you would go and collect the information. Question 7 is asking you to describe how to retrieve archived information. So think back to some of the examples given, physical, visual, audio, looking up the file on the archive database, giving the person the relevant information such as department number, archive date and many more. Can you think of any others that you can think of that you wish to add to this list? And further reading can be found on pages 11 to 14 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. Organisational procedures for archiving, retrieving and deleting information. Archiving. What information to include and where to send it. When I was a junior process server and clerk to a solicitor, we used to have a file storage facility located just outside of London. And it was our job to take the archived files there and retrieve them should they be required again 
for use for process serving or for any new cases. Retrieving. Retrieving dates, retention dates and retention procedures. Think about your company's retention procedures on how this information is being held. Deleting. Physical archive boxes are removed from storage. Contents are destroyed and boxes relabeled. Electronically archived data can be deleted straight from the server. Some companies will use facilities where they will professionally shred and destroy data after a certain amount of time stored in a professional secure warehouse. But always remember and think about the GDPR when archiving, retrieving and deleting information. Question 8 is asking you to describe organisational procedures for archiving, retrieving and deleting information. What policies and procedures does your organisation have for, for, for archiving, retrieving and deleting information? Where do you send it? What information do you include? What about retrieving for retention dates and retention procedures and how is your information deleted? Further reading can be found on pages 11 to 14 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. It is important to have retention policies relating to documents. There are lots of reasons why organisations retain documents. These range from legal requirements to sector specific regulatory requirements. In order to manage this process effectively, it is important to keep filing systems up to date. Create policies on how long to keep information, when to archive and when to destroy. Legal requirements such as those from the HM Revenue and Customs, Health and Safety Executive, the GDPR and any other regulations that may affect this. And it's determined by the physical space in the live filing system. Not every office has acres of space to style filing, and filing costs money because floor space costs money. The physical space in the archive filing system. Some companies will use the professional companies that are out there that will do archive storing for them. And should there be a lack of space in this particular warehouse, this company, part of the cost, will move it to a new location and the type of information that is being retained. Paper-based copies, again, can take up lots of information and space. And digital can also do as well. The bigger the file, the bigger the cost in some cases. Question 9 is asking you to explain the importance of document retention policies to organisations. So think about some of the areas we've just covered about keeping your filing system up to date and the policies on how long to keep your information and the legal requirements, who they are bound by and what it's determined by. Think of your organisation. What sort of policies do you have there? And how do you retrieve and archive your storage and your information? And further reading can be found on pages 11 to 14 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. Security and access requirements of off-site archives. Due to space restrictions, organisations will invariably store information at storage sites. These are either operated by the organisation themselves or contra contracted out to a storage company. Storage also includes the use of cloud-based applications. Information remains the responsibility of its original owner or organisation, so security mechanisms must be put in place to safeguard it. And these include a unique login to computers, cloud-based storage, user verification, an identity badge when physically attending locations where information is being stored, a username and password. Some content may have added restrictions, so only certain authorised staff can access it, electronically and physically. 
failure to protect information breaches GDPR. Question 10 is asking you to describe the security and access requirements of off-site archives. So think back to some of the areas that we've just covered regarding user verification, an identity badge, restricted content, and so on. And further reading can be found on pages 11 to 14 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. In this section, we will look at understand customer service delivery. And to do that, we will explain the relationship between customers' needs and expectations and customer satisfaction. Describe the features and benefits of an organization's products and or services. And explain the importance of treating customers as individuals. Explain the importance of balancing promises made to customers with the needs of an organization. Explain when and to whom to escalate problems. And describe methods of measuring their own effectiveness in the delivery of customer service. The relationship between customers' needs and expectations and customer satisfaction. Customer expectations are governed by customer needs. In plain English, a customer approaches a business or your internal department with a specific need for a product or service. From this specific need comes a specific expectation. Customer needs and expectations are directly linked to customer satisfaction. Therefore, when a customer approaches a high-end vehicle brand, they expect to pay premium prices for a premium product and there is an expectation that they will receive a commensurate premium customer experience. If customer needs and expectations are met, satisfaction will be high. But as the JD Power survey for car manufacturers on the right shows, customer needs and expectations are not always matched by satisfaction levels. As you can see, several premium vehicle brands have performed poorly. There are, of course, a number of factors, including sales volumes, which affect results. However, the results should be worrying for premium brands. Therefore, if customer needs and expectations are not met, satisfaction will be low. Question one of your assignment for this section is asking you to explain the relationship between customer needs and expectations and customer satisfaction. So customer expectations are governed by customer's needs. Customer needs and expectations are directly linked to customer satisfaction. And if customer needs and expectations are met, satisfaction will be high. If customer needs and expectations are not met, satisfaction will be low. And further reading can be found on pages 4 to 10 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. Features and benefits of products. Benefits. The advantages of a product or service. When Solutions Equinox Limited entered into an agreement to deliver your qualification, we were able to offer a product and service which brought benefits for the customer. Poplar Harker. And benefits. We were able to design all the training material required to teach the qualification teach the qualification and assess the qualification, a combination of products and services. As all elements required to deliver this qualification were being offered by one supplier, 
This brought cost saving and a one-stop source. In some instances, benefits are more important to customers than product features. Discounts on multiple purchases, for example. Benefits, for example, affordability, low running costs, safety, or even prestige. Features, for example, characteristics, attributes, and qualities of a product or service. For example, colour, size, ease of use. Features suggest how a product or service will provide its benefits. Features may help customers choose one product or service over another. Your assignment question is asking you for question two to describe the features and benefits of an organization's products and or services. And the features suggest how a product or service will provide its benefits. And features may help customers choose one product or service over another. Further reading can be found on pages four to 10 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. Each customer is unique. So treat them as such. Each customer is unique. The customer feels important to the organization. The customer feels that their problem has been heard and understood. The customer feels that action will be taken to find a solution. Marks and Spencer's coined the phrase, the customer is always right. It increases customer trust in an organisation. And you have lifelong customers. And those lifelong customers will attract new customers because word spreads. Your product, your service will have recommendations and these days, Services such as Trustpilot reviews are found available online in an instant and reviews can be placed online very, very quickly. And practice active listening. Actually listen and empathise with your customer. And identify the customer's need. And tailor your responses and actions. And whether the customer is actually always right is a matter for debate. Question three for this section is asking you to explain the importance of treating customers as individuals. Let's think about the areas that we have just covered to help you answer this question. And further reading can be found on pages four to ten of your unit handbook to help you answer it. Balancing promises to customers with the needs of the organisation. You may wish to go the extra mile to give good customer service. However, know what offers, if any, you are authorised to make. Are you authorised to make those promises? Don't overpromise. Don't promise what you can't deliver. Know that you can deliver whatever it is you are offering. And this is basic good customer service. Keep your customers informed. This is basic good customer service. Let customers know about changes or updates to their order. Again, this is basic good customer service. And give customer regular updates to let them know that you are working on their issue. Again, this is basic good customer service. Follow through on your actions. This is basic good customer service. If you say you're going to do something for your customer, do it and see it through to the end. 
and apologise if errors are made or if you've not delivered what you set out to do. This is basic good customer service. And in many surveys and results of surveys, customers have said if they'd have apologised, we'd have accepted it. But they didn't apologise, which suggests they're trying to say that they are still correct, even when they were not. And fully understand the organization's terms and offers. Are you authorized to make those promises? If you are not, you should seek assistance and authorization from those who can. Question four for this section is asking you to explain the importance of balancing problems made to customers with the needs of an organization. So, thinking back. Know what offers, if any, you're authorised to make. Don't overpromise. Know that you can deliver whatever it is that you are offering. Keep your customers informed. Let the customers know about changes or updates to their order. Give the customer regular updates to let them know you're working on the issue. And follow through on any actions. Apologise when things go wrong. Even if it's not you that's made the mistake, but someone else within your company has. Apologise. Fully understand the organization's terms and offers. Are you authorized to make this promise? If you're not, seek authorization from those who can. Further reading can be found on pages 4 to 10 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. When things don't go right, when should you escalate a problem? Well, number one, have you tried everything you know of to resolve the problem? Number two, have you reached a point that you don't think that you can help anymore? Number three, have you consulted with someone with more product or service knowledge? Number four, if you have one, have you consulted an organisational chart? Choose the right person to escalate this problem to. Who could help? Resolve the problem that you have. Direct it to the right person. Otherwise, you'll find yourself having to try to sort this out again and it's going to go around in circles. Be specific about the problem that you need to escalate. And offer the solution. Customers and your employer will always like their staff to offer solutions to problems wherever possible. And follow it up. Even if it's been offered up to somebody else to deal with, always chase up the problem to ensure that it has been dealt with. That way, the customer can see that there really are people looking after their problem and offering to find a solution for them. So question five is asking, explain when and to whom to escalate problems. So have you tried everything you know to resolve the problem? Have you reached a point that you don't think you can help anymore? Has someone been consulted with more product or service knowledge? Have you consulted an organisational chart if you have one? Choose the right person and be specific with the problem that you have to be solved. Offer solutions and follow it up, even if it's been offered to somebody else to, cons to consult and to deal with. And further reading can be found on pages 4 to 10 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. Different methods used to measure the effectiveness of your customer service delivery. There are different ways in which your effectiveness can be measured when you deliver customer service. And it is important to understand the limitations of each method and rarely would your performance be based solely on any one of those in isolation. Generally, employers will utilise the following methods to gauge your performance. Customer feedback. Peer feedback, such as 360 feedback. Or performance reviews. It is worth remembering that highly motivated staff are a business asset. They bring higher productivity. They have better organisational performance. They produce excellent customer service. Good organisational reputation is brought with it and the ability to attract top candidates for employment. 
And with that comes financial stability and the confidence to forward plan your business. Question six is asking you to describe methods of measuring your own effectiveness in the delivery of customer service. So think about the types of customer feedback that you may have experienced or you yourself may have seen. Peer feedback and the types of peer feedback you may have experienced. And performance reviews. Further reading can be found on pages 11 to 15 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. In this section, we will look at understanding the relationship between customer service and a brand. And to do that, we will explain the importance of a brand to an organization, explain how a brand affects an organization's customer service offer, explain the importance of using customer service language that supports a brand promise, identify their own role in ensuring that a brand promise is delivered. The importance of a brand to an organization. Brand differentiates from other products or services. The customers know what to expect. It brings customer loyalty. And it makes organizations and organizations more memorable. Familiarity. It increases an organization's profile and value. Well, what's in a name? Take Solutions Equinox Training Solution, this company. Some of our customers think Solutions is Latin and ask what it means. It is not Latin, but it's a memorable word and it's a play on words for solutions. Equinox suggests a new beginning, which it was for the founders of the company. This title shows that the business has an online and real world presence. And there is another version of this logo. The use of dark blue denotes the company's origins in policing. The globe features an alignment and this is repeated. This denotes our founding strap line, aligning your training needs. This is an abbreviated version of our full logo and it's used in various forms on our products. Our other company color is gray and this is featured on all our products and documents and the color is modern and contemporary. Your assignment question is asking you to explain the importance of a brand to an organization. So think back about how the brand differentiates from other products or services. Customers know what to expect. There's customer loyalty. It makes the organization memorable, it brings familiarity, and it increases organizations profile and value and further reading can be found on pages 11 to 15 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question how a brand affects an organization's customer service offer customer service can be part of a brand solutions equinox are offering as part of their brand name a solution to a customer's training needs. In this example, Tesco are making a brand promise that every little helps. The importance of customer service language that supports a brand promise. Although Solutions Equinox Limited may be unfamiliar to you, other well-known brands build customer trust through brand consistency. Can you think of other brands which use customer service language that supports a brand promise?
Question eight is asking you to explain how a brand affects an organization's customer service offer. And question nine is asking you to explain the importance of using customer service language that supports a brand promise. So think about customer service being part of a brand promise and how brand consistency builds customer trust. And further reading can be found on pages 11 to 15 of your unit handbook to help you answer these questions. Your role is vital in ensuring that a brand promise is delivered. There is very little point in a company promising to deliver a high quality service to its customers if staff do not buy into the same ethos. This is a complex subject as it links into many aspects which are not covered in this particular qualification. However, to summarise some of the factors which contribute to this particular subject. What motivates employees? It is worthwhile looking at Abraham Maslow's theory on this particular subject. Are employees sufficiently motivated? Sufficient pay, recognition, rewards, training and support. How loyal are employees to their employers. Does the employee understand the strategic direction of the company and the part they play in delivering this? And this is where biannual or annual appraisals and the objectives that are set for the employees should direct them towards these achievements so they are fully aware of the strategic direction of the company. And once these points have been established, the key question can be asked. How are you responsible for representing the organisation by fulfilling each of these promises made to customers? Question 10 is asking to identify your role in ensuring that a brand promise is delivered. So responsible for representing the organisation by fulfilling each promise that that company sets to deliver. And further reading can be found on pages 11 to 15 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. This concludes the fourth of the four sessions relating to your qualification. You will have been sent by email a time, date and go to meeting link for you to log on for the teaching session which accompanies this presentation. And to get the most from your learning journey, please ensure you log on to this online session with your trainer. From the end of this session, you should have sufficient to continue to complete your assignment too. We hope that you found this presentation useful and we encourage you to use the unit handbooks which are accessible in PDF format from your ePortfolio to support your studies. Any questions? Feel free to log on to the online learning service after this session or our remote assistance service. We can be contacted at learners at solutionsequinox.com and please, as remember, your emails must be marked in the subject heading NCFE Leadership. So we can improve our training programs, please take a moment to complete a feedback document which we will email to you. These can be returned to our normal email address. Thank you for listening.